Today we want to look at one verse in particular, First Timothy, or Second Timothy, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, we want to speak on this verse this afternoon and hopefully encourage you in the process. And even though it is a letter written to a preacher and written to an elder in the church, I do believe that it will encourage us as followers of the word, that we will have somewhat of a, a, a uh, awareness of, of what we are to hear and look for and what we are to look for the Lord to do in our life through his word. And so I want you to read with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. I'm going to use the New Living Translation this afternoon, but you can follow along in any translation you would prefer. He says in verse 3, it says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. He says they will reject, reject the truth and chase after myths. Can we all say amen? amen? I want to use verse 3 as the focus verse, and I want to use it to preach to you on the title, An Itch the Word Won't Scratch. Uh, uh, an Itch that the Word Won't Scratch. We want to look at these verses, and, and I believe these are very precious words to us that Paul gave us, and he is writing to this young elder, and he gives us a list of things that, that really should make us think about what's going on in our world and also what was going on in his world. I want to give you a few words that describes a generation. I want you to listen to these words as I, as I read them and think about the things that are being said in description of a particular generation. The words would be self-absorbing and, and money-hungry, self-promoting, stuck up and profane, contemptuous of parents, crude and coarse, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous and traitorous, hip hypocritical is one of the words that will be associated with the others. And as we listen to these words, we would think that these are words that would describe our own time, times that we're living in here in America. But if we look closely at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and, and even going forward to chapter 3, we'll see that these words are actually words that describe the, the, the generation of Paul's own time. He's giving Timothy an, an expression and a description of what's going on in his world, what he should look out for uses a word and a phrase to help them understand something that that will be observable and, and measurable even as he with a watchful eye by the spirit discerns what's going on amen among him he wants him to understand that this is what time does to a people time seems to bring the worst or the best out of people there's an old saying that they would say if you ever want to know what you're dealing with just give it time because in time, the real thing will reveal itself. Can I get an amen for somebody? Yeah. I, I can't read chapter 3 of First Timothy without thinking of Israel. Because he talks about in verse 1 of chapter 3 that in the last days or as it would say in the last times, these things would occur. And I think about the nation of Israel because if anybody knew anything about time, it was Israel. Israel had prophets that would come to them, telling them of a time in which God would do one of two things. He would either bring judgment or he would bring redemption and restoration. In many instances in those times, they would get the worst end of that because they would fail to hear the words of the prophets and they would go along their own way and God would in the end have to judge them according to their works. Paul teaches us that judgment is always a product of time. That if we allow things to continue to go in a way that it is not pleasing to God, in God's own appointed time, amen, he will judge accordingly. This is why, amen, when evildoers and people that we may call our haters or people who mean to do us wrong or getting on our nerves or doing things against us, we need not to worry because in God's own time, he will bring judgment. How many of y'all believe that here today? There are examples all throughout the Bible where time, time is used to signify that God is on, on the horizon of doing something. He's right at the verge of doing something, but he always encourages his people to be patient and to wait and to see his hand of vengeance in their lives. 
He uses the phrase last days to trigger their minds into thinking the things that were written about uh, the nation of Israel in the, in the words of the prophets. This word, the phrase last days in chapter 3 verse 1 is not new to the audience. It was something that was used by the prophets to determine the destiny or the fate of the nation of Israel. It describes an end, but not the end. It describes an end, but not the end. And in other words, Paul's use of this eschatological word is not to, amen, to refer to the end of all things, but the, but the end of a nation, the end of a particular value system, the end of a cosmic arrangement. God is going to bring an end to the things that have always opposed him, no matter how strong and how powerful they may be. There's something we must know about God, that God doesn't wait till the end of the world to bring down kingdoms and powers and, and influences. How many of y'all know that God will show himself to be strong right here on earth? Can I get an amen for somebody? I mean, that's why Jesus came and saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is why he taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It was a subtle message to the world that you may think that you're running things now, but hold on tight. Time has a way of proving my power. How many of y'all know God has power here today? Amen. Amen. This is what I think I want us to see here today as we read into chapter three and then move into chapter four. Paul was trying to help Timothy understand that there is a national and even a, a universal, a universal agenda to oppose God's will and God's purpose for this creation. There is a hostility. The devil, Satan and his angels were against the will of God. And Paul wanted a man, Timothy, to understand that the fight that is coming from the enemy is not going to let up just because Jesus got up from the grave. Amen. I wish I could tell you here today. That because Jesus got up, we'll never have to fight another day in our lives. That we'll never have turmoil. We'll never have a bad day. We'll never have, have sick days and sad days and disappointments and struggles. But I remember what Paul wrote. He says, Though those that live godly, those who represent the name of Christ, the Bible says that they will endure persecution. I mean, how many of y'all can say you've been through some things since you've been saved here today? Amen. That you had to fight some battles that you never thought you would have to fight, that you'd have to, amen, see some times and some things happen that you never thought would happen. But how many of y'all know that God is all powerful here today? Amen. I want you to understand what's happening. Paul wants us to see that whenever a nation or a people group, whenever a group of people lose their commitment to biblical truth, they lose their ability to exist. Amen. In other words, whenever we lose our commitment to God, we lose the power that we have to exist. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. amen. When we disconnect ourselves from biblical truth, disconnect ourselves from the word of God, we cease the ability to remain. In other words, God has a way of getting rid of people that won't follow his word. Amen. How many of y'all have made up your mind you're going to follow God's word here today? Amen. amen. That you're going you're gonna to do whatever it takes. Now, I want to just say here today, amen, that America is facing a terrible fate. Man, America is facing a terrible, a terrible dilemma because without the presence of biblical truth, we lose the ability to remain moral. Amen. We lose the ability to remain conscious of God's righteousness and we lose the ability to remain godly. See, the world thinks being good means being godly. But I want to help you understand here today. There's a difference between goodness and godliness. Amen. God didn't call us to be good. He called us to be godly. He called us to be like him. He called us to be righteous and holy. And there are a whole lot of good folk that's going to find themselves lost because they would rather be good than be godly. How many of y'all have made up your mind you want to be godly here today? I don't want to just do good things. I want to do God things. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. And so the word tells us, amen, that and Paul is trying to teach Timothy that if the world is going to do what God wants them to do, they're going to need to find strength in the word of God. Amen. They're going to need to find a desire for the word of God. They can't be cared about with any old thing. They have to find themselves with a love and a hunger for God's word. Amen. And so I looked at the world that we're in and particularly America. The world is going astray, but particularly America is facing very dark times. I want you to listen to this. And this is not uh, this is not to criticize, but this is to, uh, uh, to heighten our awareness. Amen. The world has been projected to be entering into what is called a post religion a post-christian society which is to say that what our grandparents did future generations won't do 
Amen. What they believe, future generations won't believe. What they practice, future generations won't practice. In fact, a study came out recently saying that only 11% of Americans read their Bibles daily. Amen. I want you to think about that for a moment. 11% of Americans read their Bibles daily. Amen. I often tell us all the time, as much as I can, develop a good a prayer life, a good prayer life, and a good Bible reading life. Can I get an amen for somebody? C.H. Spurgeon said once that a worn Bible is a sign of a, a spiritual person, that a person who has a Bible that's worn out, falling apart. Amen. He says that their life is most likely put together. Amen. How many of y'all can say amen to that here today? Amen. Some, some of us, if we're not careful, we have these Bibles for five and six years and the pages still sticking together. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. Your page is still sticking together. Amen. The, the glue is still binding it hard. I, I want to see some Bibles that are worn out. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. Every couple of years, you need to be buying you a new Bible because you're reading it and you're studying it and you're letting the sun hit it and you, you're taking it where you're going with you. Amen. As the psalmist says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. Amen. In other words, more of the word in you keeps you spiritual. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. But notice this. I want to talk about my generation for a moment because I fit in this category. Amen. Because the trend says that future generations, the more that we see of future generations, the less that they will see a practice of biblical reading. In fact, my generation, only 35 percent of my generation, the millennial generation, will 35 percent of them will never read the Bible. Thirty five percent of my generation will never read the Bible. They never pick it up. They never read it. They never go to it for guidance. That's over a third of my generation that you're trying to tell, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit fornication, don't cheat, don't cuss. You're trying to teach them morality, but it doesn't stick because they don't have any sense of absolute truth. Can I get an amen for somebody? 14% read less than once a year. 11% read once or twice a year. 6% read three or four times a year. 9% read once a month, and 6% read once a week. That's 81% of the millennial generation that has a poor or non-existing Bible reading habit. Let that sink in for a moment. Your children, my children, your grandchildren won't read the Bible according to these statistics. And we look at those trends and we say, oh, it's, there's doom and there's, there's a terrible day heading for America. But I got news for you that this 81%, as bad as it is, is not that far from the most reading generation of our time. Can I get an amen for somebody? In fact, if we go to the elder generation, which is those who are 70 years or more, those 70 years old or more, only 66% of those people a matter of fact, let me put it this way. 66% of the 70 years or older don't read their Bible in a healthy way. That's only a difference of 15% between the millennial and the oldest. Can I just tell you something that perhaps we need to say a little more clearer and louder? No one in America at any time has really gave a serious read of the word of God. Can I get a man for somebody? In other words, we've been religious, but we haven't been following Jesus Christ. There's a difference. I know we want to beat on the millennials, but the truth of the matter is no one at any given time has really given a serious read of the word of God. And it shows. I heard this thing once before and I was kind of uh, uh, burdened down. And it's interesting working in Christian environments as I work at a Christian university and, and that puts me in Christian environments. And it's funny the things that happen in these environments. Hey man, you would assume that in Christian environments you get a sense of Christianity. Can I get a man for somebody? Uh, that, that if you're in a, in a like minded space, people will look more like Christ. But can I tell you something? Amen. You'll be shocked to know that most Christians won't look like Christ because our vision of God is impaired. Our vision of God is based on examples of ungodliness rather than understanding of God's word. I just want to know how many of y'all can say today, I'm going to take God's word seriously here today. Can I get an amen for somebody? I just want to know that we have a generation of people that will say, I want all of God's word and nothing else because only God's word is going to keep me. Can I get an amen for somebody? And that's what I want to know here today. And, and I want you to see here that when we have this seriousness, we have this passion for God's word, that's when communities begin to change. 
That's when people begin to become awakened to God's truth and their lives are changed for the better. There's a responsibility that Paul gives the preacher who is Timothy here. This, this understanding of the world that he's in, the times that he, that he is facing, it creates a charge. In chapter 4, verse 1, he gives him a charge or a commandment. He says to, Paul, to Timothy in verse 2, he says, preach the word. Can I get an amen for somebody? He says, Timothy, with the times that you are facing, your only obligation is to preach the word. Preach that word. That word there, that phrase word, that term word is the message, which is to say God has given us a message that should be changing lives. Amen. I think about it all the time. The, the word of God is powerful. I think about what the word of God did to a man called Paul. I can imagine Paul replaying this in his mind as he is, as he is rehearsing this to Timothy. Here he is as a religious man, a, a pioneer in the Jewish community. He has all the zeal in the world. He's out there killing Christians in the name of God. But one day, Jesus shows up in his life. Can I get an amen for somebody? I mean, how many of y'all can say Jesus has shown up in your life here today? Hallelujah. That in a way that he showed up in your life, you have not been the same since. And I, I can imagine Paul writing these words to Timothy, understanding the, the power of the message of Jesus Christ. And he's saying to Timothy, with all the heart and passion that he can possibly muster up, He's saying to Timothy, Timothy, preach that message about the Christ that I met on the road of Damascus. Tell people about this man, because if you can tell somebody about this man, what happened to me will happen to them. And I want to say this here to you today, that if your life has really been changed by the power of the message of Jesus Christ, you can't help but to share it with somebody. Can I get an amen for somebody? I, I, I don't know how you feel when you get a little bit of money in your pocket. Amen. But I, well, I walked with a little pep in my step when I got money in my pocket. Can I get an amen? amen? I don't think as much as I, I know, you, I know I'm not the only one by myself. You all know when you get some money in your pocket, you walk with a little stride in your step. Can I get an amen? Amen. You walk with some confidence. Your head is held up. Your back is straight. Amen. You have that smirk on your face like you can conquer the world. But how many of y'all know if you got Jesus in your life, you can walk with a run. Can I get an amen for somebody? You should walk with all the boldness of a lion. Amen. Understanding that you can conquer anything that come in your life. And this is what Paul is trying to get Timothy to see. That the word is powerful. The word is powerful. But, but he says to Timothy, he says, I need you to preach that word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, do what the prophets did. Preach when they want it. Preach when they don't want it. Can I get an amen for somebody? If you're doing this, Timothy, to be popular, you're in the wrong business. Can I get an amen for somebody? I mean, I was looking at a, a very famous preacher here that did some things that was inappropriate on the stage quite a few weeks ago. And, and, I, and I saw the activity and all of the news and the media. It was all over the place. And it was getting a bad name. I, just, I mean, it was really, really bad. And I, and I could see, amen, the hurt on his face as he did this thing. But, but what I was most considerate of is it wasn't necessarily the hurt, amen, of what he did because it wasn't his first time doing it. It was the hurt of the reactions that he received for what he did. Can I get an amen for somebody? It took a strike against his, his fame and his prestige and his popularity. And sometimes we can get caught up in being, uh, man, popular and being liked and being known and being loved by people. That we forget that our only responsibility is to give you the word of God. Can I get an amen for somebody? I was reading a book by Tony Evans, and Tony Evans said this. He says, if our preaching does not create a deeper thirst for God's word, we should look at what we're preaching. Can I get an amen for somebody? I mean, if, if our preaching does not drive you to the word of God to read it for yourself, we need to figure out what we're doing wrong. Amen. And I pray here today that every time you come here, that it pushes you back to want to pick up your Bible and read it. Can I get an amen for somebody? I pray that every time you leave here, your mind says, I want more of God's word because it is God's word that, that is changing my life. But as there is a responsibility for the preacher, there's also a responsibility for the hearer. Can I get an amen for somebody? Because I don't care how well the preacher preach. If your ear is not ready for the word, if your heart is not prepared for the seed, which is the word of God, you will still leave here as empty as you came. Can I get an amen for somebody? I remember when I was growing up, I used to hear the preachers say all the time, my parents used to have us to do this. Amen. We used to come in church. We used to kneel down and pray. Can I get an amen for somebody? 
What, what were we doing? We were getting our hearts ready for what God was going to do in the service. Amen. We used to have to drive to the, to the, uh, to the church Amen. With a sense of sacred solemnness. We we came with our mind prepared as they would say, get your heart and mind prepared for the word of the Lord. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. I was thinking about today. My children have no sense of that. They were back there laughing and playing and playing their games and amen and doing this and that. And I, and I know times have changed. Amen. But we must be very careful to treat the word of God as sacred. Can I get amen for somebody? That this word is not just our words, but they are God's words. These are God's words to us. And so Paul says here that the hearer has a responsibility as well as the preacher. He says there's something that you want to do. The first thing he says, and, and as we look at verses, uh, chapter 4, verse 3 through verse 4, the first thing he says is you have to watch what you listen to. Right. Amen. We live in a very digital age and and probably one of the blessings and the cursings of, 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 of coronavirus and the pandemic is that we have a plethora of, of, of preachers at our disposal. We can look and pick and choose. We can figure out who we want to listen to today. We can pick out who we want to get. And, and, and you have all these different varieties of words coming from all different directions. But, but Paul would tell us that we need to be careful what we listen to. He would tell us that we keep our ears attentive to the word of God and not just any old thing. This is what he wants us to understand, that a collapsing nation, a collapsing individual, a, a, a collapsing people group will always have a diet for unhealthy or unspiritual food. Hey Amen. If you look at a country or a person that is going the wrong way, you can always assure yourself that they're eating from the wrong spiritual tables. Amen. I want you to ask yourself in your private time, what is my spiritual diet like? Can I get an amen for somebody? What makes me feel good inside? What kind of preaching, what kind of word makes me get up in the morning to want to do God's will? Is it the promise that I'll be rich one day? It is a promise that one day I have everything I ever want. Is it the promise that I'll never have any problems or struggles? If that's what is waking you up in the morning and giving you a desire to live for God, I want to tell you that's the wrong motivation. Can I get an amen for somebody? Man, but if you want to get up in the morning and live for God because you know that God is worthy, I want you to know you are right on track. Because how many of y'all know whether we have a good day or a bad day, God is always worthy. Can I get an amen for somebody? If you're sick in your body, how many of y'all know God is always worthy? If you have no money in your pocket, how many of you know that God is always worthy? See, the word teaches you things about God that causes you to appreciate who he is. It shows us as we're listening, that God, he wants to give us this spiritual food. But how many of y'all know God won't force you to eat? Amen. Amen. My little five-month-old here, she's turning six months in a couple days. And I remember whenever she was on the bottle and she was drinking that milk and drinking that milk. And, and, man, and she got her appetite up to the point where she'd just be drinking and drinking all day long. And one day my wife called me and said, you know, I can't get her to be satisfied. She's cranky and she's just crying. I done fed her. She's not sleepy. I don't know what's going on. I said, well, I don't know either. She said, maybe she's hungry. She said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give her some rice cereal. Can I get an amen for somebody? You know what that old rice cereal does, doesn't it? It gets you full real quick. Amen. That rice cereal took care of those needs. But after a while, the rice cereal wouldn't do it. And, and Bettina said, we're going to give her some, some yams and some peas and some carrots. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? And she said, we're going to get her some jar food. And I'll never forget that day. Amen. That evening. Layla was crying her eyes out, screaming and, and yelling and hollering. And I looked over there and my wife was trying to give her the jar food. Can I get an amen? Give her that jar food and give her that jar food and just give her that jar food. And, and my wife was just trying to force it to eat it. And it was her first time. She didn't like it. But my wife kept sticking it to her. And after a while, she'd be eating that jar food like it's candy. Can I get an amen for somebody? But this is what I want you to see. Unlike my wife. God won't force you to eat nothing. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. My wife kept sticking it to my daughter, giving her that food because she knew, amen, that it would be good for her and she knew she could develop an appetite for it. But I want you to see what God says to us. God is saying to us, you got to want my word. Can I get an amen for somebody? You got to want this word. This is why he says, amen, in verse three, that a time is coming where people will no longer listen to sound doctrine. They won't listen to sound doctrine. They'll listen to things that don't come from God's word. I was looking at a, a preacher the other day. Amen. He had this guy travel in 
I mean, the guy was doing all kind of weird things. He, he went up and he was supposedly prophesying. He went up to a gentleman and the gentleman, he said, your body is feeling, you feel a, a burning sensation in your body right now, aren't you? And the man looked up at him and says, no, I'm not feeling anything. Amen. And, and, the, and the church, and, and he said, don't worry, you will feel it. And I looked at, and I was looking around and I was saying to myself, that would have been the cue to me to get up and leave. Can I get an amen for somebody? But don't you know that people will hear the prophet get it wrong and sit right there and listen to it over and over and over and over again and not just sit there and listen to it, but they will out of their own pockets, they will fund false prophets. Can I get an amen for somebody? What has happened? Their listening, their appetite, their diet has become unhealthy. I'll tell you something that I tried. Layla was born in August and I made up my mind that I was going to start eating healthy. For four months straight, I went to the gym. For four months straight, I wouldn't miss a day. I was running, lifting weights, doing everything I could find to get my body into shape. And I'll tell you, nothing happened. Can I get an amen for somebody? <laughs> nothing happened. I kept looking at my wife. I said, can you tell the difference? She said, oh, yeah, I can tell the difference. And I know what that means. Can I get an amen for somebody? Nothing has changed. <laughs> amen. If you got to ask somebody if they can tell a difference, they can't tell a difference. Can I get an amen? But I kept on going and I kept on going. I told my wife at about December, I said, you know what I'm going to do? In January, I'm going to change what I eat. Can I get an amen for somebody? I'm going to stop eating sugar. I'm going to stop drinking Kool-Aid. I'm going to stop, stop drinking sodas. I'm going to drink nothing but water. I'm not going to put anything to my mouth but water. And I can tell you that in one month, I had far more progress than I had in four months. You want to know why? Because eating changes the game when you're trying to improve your health. I want, this to, I want you to understand this. What you listen to becomes your spiritual food. And I don't care how much you read, how much you pray, how much you fast. If you don't change your diet, you won't change your life. Can I get an amen for somebody? How many of y'all need your life changed here today? Hallelujah. How many of y'all want to see God's word work in your life? You got you to change your diet. You got to change what is being put into you. The next thing he says here, that once you change your listening, you must change who you follow. He says in verse three that the time will come when they will they will no longer listen to sound doctrine. They won't listen to wholesome teaching, but they will follow their own desires. You see, what he's showing us is that they won't be settled. He, he's saying that they will have an itch. That is a, it is a figurative word for saying that they're going to have a curiosity that looks for something interesting and juicy. It is bits of information. It's kind of like what we see on social media, that most people's religion is the sum total of what they can read in a 160 character post. There's no depth. There is no reach. There is no pursuit. It's a snapshot of subjective truth instead of a culmination of absolute truth from God's word. You got people who think they know everything about the Bible because they read it on Facebook. Can I get an email for somebody? They think they know everything about the word of God because they heard it from some man in a 30 second sound bite. But I want us to know here today that when you are following the right thing in order to get the right word, it's going to take you having a diligent pursuit for God's word. That is saying in my heart, I want all that God has to give. And I know that in my lifetime, I won't get it all, but I'll spend my entire life getting what I can get. Watching who you follow. I, I had to catch myself. I have about two guys. I had, when the pandemic came, I had about five guys I was looking at on, on YouTube. Every Sunday, I would go five of them. I would check them out. Some of them I would go because I want to see how crazy they would act this Sunday, to be quite honest. Can I get an amen for somebody? I just wanted to see what could they possibly do this Sunday that would be worse than what they did last Sunday. And the Spirit kept t telling me, you know what? Some of these guys are not giving you anything that is helpful. You have to measure who you're following. If the guy on TV ain't preaching anything worth hearing, why follow him? Can I get an amen for somebody? Because you're listening, once it becomes impaired, guess what happens next? Your following tends to follow what you're listening for. Well, notice the next thing. He says, you gotta make sure, you're he says, they will follow their own desires 
and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. How many of us can say today, I want to hear the truth? Can I say something to you? The truth sometimes is going to hurt. Can I get an amen for somebody? That's why we sometimes don't follow the ones who will give us the truth. Because the truth hurts. If you're quite honest, a cheesecake tastes better than a carrot any day of the week. Can I get an amen for somebody? I told my wife, after these 30 days, when I get my cheat day, I already have laid out what I want. A cheesecake, a good cup of coffee, and I want me a, a Chick-fil-A milkshake. I just want it for one day. I just want it for one day. And I'm going to go right back to my 30 days again. And I'm going to keep it going. But let me tell you something. You cannot in any way hang around a candy shop if you're looking for a bowl of fruit. Can I get an amen for somebody? You got to find your way away from that candy shop so you can get what needs to be inside of you. How many of y'all want some spiritual fruit here today? <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I don't want any more spiritual candy. I don't want any more spiritual milkshakes. I'm over all that. Give me some real meat and fruit of the word of God. Amen. So he says, watch who you follow. In other words, get settled. But the third thing he says is don't reject truth. Don't reject truth. He says this in verse four, they will reject truth. There is going to be a time when people, they're going to reject truth. He says here, there's a, a refusal. And, and that word truth, if you look at it, it is a word that means help. It's like whenever you say, Lord, I know I need help. I need help. Lord, help me. But you won't go to the source that brings help. You reject truth. And he says they will reject the truth. But the fourth thing he says is that they will chase. They will chase after myths. They're going to chase things. That will give them a sense of carnal gratification. When you see the word chase there, it is the depiction of what we are interested in, what we are attentive to, and what we are trusting in. You never chase something that is not interesting, not attention grabbing, and not trustworthy in your eyes. When you chase after something, you're chasing after something that have all three of those attributes, your attention, your interest, and your trust. And the truth of the matter is some things we chase are not worth trusting in. Can I get an amen for somebody? So what he says here is he says you're going to reject the truth. And because you're rejecting the truth, you're then going to chase after things that are not worth your pursuit. Notice the trend here. Everything starts with listening. What you listen to has a way of depicting or determining rather what you will follow. What you follow has a way of determining what you're looking for. What you're looking for has a way of determining what you will reject and what you will chase. But it all starts with listening. There's something that they would always say. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Can I get an amen for somebody? Why did he do that? Because he wants us to listen more than we talk. I take God's word and I say to the Lord, Lord, speak to me. Can I get an amen for somebody? I mean, just try it one time. Just open your, your Bible and just say, Lord, I'm going to read whatever you put on my heart to read. And I just want you to speak to me today. I'm not going to tell you about my problems. I'm not going to tell you about what I want or my desires. I'm just going to ask you to speak to me today. I asked a, a very successful suit uh, merchant. He has this big company where he sells these suits. And I mean, he sells them all across Columbia. Everybody I know that buys nice suits, go to him and get them. And I asked him, I said, how did you get so successful? How did you turn this, this, this business from being something you were handing out of your trunk? This is how he started. He was selling suits out of his trunk to having a wonderful store where you have all the clientele that you could ever ask for. How did you do it? You know what he said to me? He said, I read God's word. He said, I built my business on everything in God's word. I just basically read and I applied it to my business. Can I get an amen for somebody? Can I tell you a little secret? Reading this book will improve your life. Can I get an amen for somebody? Oh yes, it will change your life if you read it and as James says, do it. And I sat back and I said, wow. No John Maxwell. No business 101 class. 
No MBA. No training. Just God's word. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. Just God's word. What a testimony to God's word. That it can do something as powerful as turn a man who has a desire to please God with his business and make him successful. I want you to see what was said by this, this, this scholar, this writer, if you will. She said, active listening is being humble and hunting and searching for the best ideal possible. Listening is saying, Lord, I don't know what I should want or what I can have, but I'm listening to you to tell me which way to go. And I just believe it today that the word of God has a lot to say to us. I'll, I'll end it by saying this. There was a story, I heard my dad say this a year, years ago about a pastor who had a son. And this is to show you the power of listening to God, not to man, but to God. He said that the, the father taught his children that whatever he calls their name, that they ought to respond. Every time he calls their name, they should stop whatever they're doing and they should listen and, and, and just their attention should be to him. He trained them to be that way. He talked about his son who was outside playing and the ball that he had was playing and it was rolling into the street. And as the ball was rolling the street, the son obliviously just went running after the ball, headed towards the street full of traffic. And right in that moment, he called the son's name and the boy stopped as the ball was running into the street. Right there in that moment, the power of the voice of that father saved that young boy's life. Can I get an amen for somebody? The ability to hear the voice and right there respond, it saved his life. That's how I see the word of God. We have to treat the word as if it is God's voice because it is trying to save our life. Can I get an amen for somebody? Hallelujah. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you what I know here. This book will save your life, y'all. And you have to treat it as such. You have to say to yourself, I can't live another day unless this book tells me where to go. There's some things in my life I can't get straight unless I go to the word and find out what it's saying. There's some matters in my family, in my, in my relationships that I can't fix unless I go to the word and figure it out. The Lord will tell me what I need to know. There's some things I'm doing right now, prayerfully doing, asking the Lord's guidance on it. And I'm monitoring everything I'm planning by what the word of God says. If the word doesn't tell me that this is a virtuous way to go, guess what? My mind is made up. I'm not going to do it. No matter how enticing it is, no matter how captivating it may seem, no matter how promising it may be, everything is a risk if you don't follow the word of God. But I can tell you one thing. You follow God's word and you'll go 100 for 100. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. I was looking up the free throw records one, one time. And there's this one guy who had about 90%. He was, I mean, he just never missed. But what I found out is that because he was human, he had to miss at least once. Can I get an amen for somebody? When you go with God's word, you'll never miss. You'll never miss because God's word will guide you all the way. How many of y'all are depending on God's word here today? <laughs> amen. I mean, are you really depending on God's word? Are you depending on it so much you're going to go home and read it tonight? Can I get an amen for somebody? That you're going to read it tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. This word is alive. Don't be caught in the cultural, the cultural dilemma that this world is facing of living without God's word in their life. It is a road destined for disaster. This country is headed into a dark place, not because men are getting worse, but because men are failing to read God's word. So let us be the ones who will stand up, stand out. And follow God's word all the way. Will it be popular? Not at all. Will it be easy? Probably not. Will it be comfortable? I can almost assure you that it won't. But will it be worth it? I can guarantee you that it will be. It will be well worth it in the end. So I thank God for you here today. Can we give God praise for his word here today? No other reason but God's word. We're thankful for his word. Amen. And I thank God that it is alive and speaking.